shake you guys off a little bit, just get some energy up. So, I think what I'd like, I'm audible, right? But do we need the mic? Yes. Sure, okay, cool. <laughs> and you're sitting right in front. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> So this is what I'd like us to do. Please raise your hands, both of them, right? Um, just wiggle your fingers. Wiggle your fingers. Wiggle your fingers. Develop a rhythm, your own rhythm. And start wiggling yourself, your waist, left to right. And the gents are going to struggle with this. And start wiggling your waist, left to right. And then uh, start tuning your head also in the same tune. Stick your tongue out. And then let's get some voice in there. And then while doing that, try saying to Jose. Thank you so much. Um, and I think it's very essential, but I think before I go into that, so let me tell a little story, right? It's just as part of warming the people up. So, a priest, one Saturday afternoon, decides to go visit one of his elderly members, right? He, 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 he drives out knocks on the door, she opens the door for him, eagerly and excitedly welcomes him into the house. He takes his seat, she immediately jumps into conversation. And But before she does that, I mean, she does what all amazing elderly people do, she offers him tea and coffee, he gets the coffee, they start talking. But he eyes something amazing on the table, right? It's a bowl full of peanuts. But they look juicy, they look good, they look fresh. So he pardons her in the middle of the conversation and says, Marjorie, could you please pause for a second? I'd like to have some of your peanuts if you don't mind. She says, almost certainly I do not mind. He starts devouring them. Um, 30 minutes into the conversation, he realizes that he's devoured, or rather he's, 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 he's chowed all the peanuts, right? Then he pauses himself, he excuses himself and says, I am sorry I finished all your peanuts. They were just so scrumptious and they're so soft and they're so gushy. She says, oh my goodness, I never eat peanuts and it's not a problem at all. Because I know, because of the fact that I don't have teeth, I normally just uh, suck the chocolate that is around the peanuts. <laughs> so as part of... <laughs> so, so that's entrepreneurship right there, right? How many of you guys have walked into a situation that looked good only to find that the cream of the situation has been taken out? But I think for me, that's part and parcel of the, of the four L's, right? And I think the first L for me is listen. And, and you need to understand, and I think has been spoken about, I mean, in this fast-paced world, there's a lot happening in and around us. And everything is competing for our attention. Our kids, our spouses, our partners, our employees, the markets. And as an entrepreneur, you almost get into a space where you're almost confused sometimes, right? Some days you wake up in the morning and you think to yourself, well, it seems like the new trend is the fourth industrial revolution. Let me go and find what this thing is. Maybe I need to disrupt stuff. Or maybe I need to, maybe instead of maintaining buildings, I need to rather go into the design space. Maybe instead of going to the design space, maybe I need to do interior decorating. So there's a lot of things that are jockeying for our attention. But how many of us are really taking the time out to actually listen? <coughs> but specifically listening to what opportunities have to say. You know, in the fast pace, in the, in, so, Okay, cool. So in the fast-paced movement of things, it's important to be able to, to listen because how many people hear stuff? Everyone hears stuff. Yeah. Everyone hears stuff. And a wise person once said, and then they've written about this everywhere, that it's not necessarily about what you are busy with. It's, a, it's whether or not what you are busy with is profitable or not. Is it effort put into the wrong things or is it effort put into the right things? But in sitting in various meetings with clients, whether they were sales meetings or it was a meeting over lunch discussing various things, I have realized that the sale most of the time has come out of the things that they never said. The sale has always come out of the things that they never said. It is the unspoken stuff that you need to listen out for that will help you grow your business and move your business to the next uh, and move your business to the next level. When we are going through document, when we are going through proposals and we are going through documents and, and uh, maybe they send us an RFQ and we're looking for, and then they're looking for baseline things. I normally say to the guys that I work with that they're looking for functionality. Where is the efficiency? Where is the actual pain in this request that they're putting out and how do we solve it? 
So if it means that we need to sit back and go as far as going on their social media to understand the client's archetype, where they're spending their time, what are they focusing on, that gives us a better understanding of who they are so that when we're engaging them, we're engaging them at their level, not just of their functionality, but of us being able to answer their pain in business. But what are we listening to? Because you need to understand that, and, I think, and I'd like to think that as an entrepreneur, when you are starting out your business, you must also understand it from a branding perspective. The brand takes after you, so it emulates you. Because you do, not brand by, you do not brand by duplication, you do not brand by replication, but you brand by uniqueness. That is why if as an individual, you are a charismatic individual, or you're a bubbly character, you're a serious character, in order for you to scale your business and grow it so that you are able to also attract the right kind of people when employing the right people. You need to brand it by replication. So you keep it as authentic as you possibly can. Why? Because authenticity sells like that. So authenticity sells like hotcakes. Yeah. And you see, so this when I came across this, it threw me back, right? Because all my life, and I'll share this in my entrepreneurial journey, right? When I was young growing up, and not necessarily young, I'm lying, but when I got into entrepreneurship. I always dreamed and envisioned of a corner office wherever, right? Whether it was a, a Rose Bank or a Sandton and whatever. And I've always identified as that being success. But I think, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? Because all of us are chasing different things. But little did I know of the fact that the product that we are selling, I mean, it's just printing, it's a commodity. Any Tom, Dick and Harry can print. You can literally drive out of here and walk down the street and find someone who could make it the same Tom, and Pula banners that are out here. You can literally drive in literally less than, less than a 10 kilometer radius, you could probably um, mash out 10 or 15 people that do the same thing. <coughs> but when we started to understand that the fact that we are township, the fact that we are township, we are able to manipulate that in it playing a key role, in, in it playing a key role in being our unique selling proposition, they started to change the game completely. So we then started to spend the majority of the conversation talking to the client about the features and benefits of what we have as a, as a 5% could do to their 90% overall strategy. So we are spending the majority of the time trying to understand what is it that you do and how could you improve and what, what are the top three competitors in your space doing in your space better than you and what are the top and what are the bottom three doing in your very same space. So there was a level of education there that sets us apart. But a beautiful thing that sets us apart is, oh, so you do all of these things out of the township? So instead of, it being a, instead of it being a weak footing as I have always con con conditioned it and also perceived it, it started to become a strong footing. And then it hit me. You do not build it by replication. So you're not the next Toko San. You're not the next Coca-Cola. I'm, I'm not the next Richard Branson. I'm the next Bulelani. Mm. I've got nuances of amazing inspirational, um, I've got nuances of amazing inspirational stories. So the pioneering entrepreneurial story which is Toko San mm. is an inspiration to, it's an inspiration from a values perspective from a mission perspective, from an insurgent perspective. So that when we want to map out insurgent growth, we use them as a we use them as a measuring tool. When you want to understand are you mapping out your dreams in the right manner? Because then you will then get lost in conversation when you are sitting with one of the executives and they're trying to understand what is it that you are selling us and you'll be and you and you your whole entire conversation is gonna be centered around their mission statement instead of positioning yourself in terms of what they do and what they want to achieve out of you. I learned very early that whenever I went to, whenever I identified powerful brands or people to work with, that every time I went to them and I was like, you know what, I'm, you're such a Pumeza man, you're such a beautiful lady, I want to work with you, you're so powerful, you're so successful, your brand is so great, I think that we should do this and do this. And then I realized that every time I, that was my approach, she shut me down every single time, 180% of the time. Because what I was doing is I was not listening. I was not listening to what she was saying. What she was saying is that, dude, I'm on the move. I'm trying to make sales. Because all of us know that sales are the lifeline of every business. It's at the epicenter of every single thing that we do, right? But what she's saying is, if you want to plug into me, how do you fit into my current existing ecosystem? Play in my space at my rate, and you will then jump into my way. And when you are in my bandwagon, show me the features and benefits of what it is exactly that you're going to deliver. Sorry, oh, goodness, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, man, oh, sorry. Baptized you. Sorry, 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 sorry,
I'm that guy. We're resurrecting and we're baptizing. Oh, man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Some drama. Some drama. We live in a country with a little bit of spice. So. You're playing in her space. Yeah, I'm playing in her space now. I'm forcing myself in her space. Sorry about that, Kumeza. Yeah, I'll get you flowers. Please do it to me, Yeah, let's make sure you could. Yeah. You're right? Are you sure? Yeah. That's all. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, so I think going playing in their space at their So, so I think for me, it's all about playing at their space. Mm. It's always been about playing at their space and at their rate. Mm. Because when you're jockeying for attention and you want to get the business. The conversation will always be centered around but what's in it for us. And that's the conversation because the moment you're able to answer what's in it for us, then you start jumping into their conversation. So another part of the book, and so I'm giving the book away, is that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm putting in the book is what I call the diversion tactic. Now I use the diversion tactic a lot and I'll use a strategy. If it works for you, it's cool. So because of the fact that I realize that print, print is commoditized, man, every individual commoditizes print, right? And there were certain brands that I wanted to work with that I had. And these brands would shut me down, even if I went to these brands and I said, well, these are the features and benefits, we are the most cost effective, this thing is gonna help you guys save more, you're gonna be more efficient, you guys will be able to set up and take down an event much quicker, it's gonna drive your, uh, you're gonna be competitive and all this stuff. They were hearing all these things, but they were not really buying into whatever it is that we needed them to buy into, right? So what we then started to do, to do then is then a diversion tactic, it's what I call a diversion tactic. To then say that these brands that um these brands that we are eyeing or these individuals that we are eyeing, who are they eyeing? Who are they looking up to? Are they as a competitor or, or as a brand or as an individual that they aspire to? And how easy is how easy would it be for you to get the attention of that individual or that brand? Because the moment you capture the attention of the brand, you have captured the whole entire sale. Now you've got what they call brand report. So remember the story, right? A couple of years ago, there was a painting of our former president. It wasn't a good painting. But one guy was aggrieved by the painting, so he decided to buy a canister of paint. He stomped it to the gallery. What did he do with the canister of paint? He poured it all over the painting. The value of the painting, the proposed value of the painting was probably going to go for about 300,000 rand. After that, it went for about 5 million. Why? It was bought by a Russian for about five or six million. Why? It was now endowed with a story. So, these nuances in around developing and building a brand are all about me formulating a story. It's actually the story. I never understood it, but it's the story. So when we come in, well, we are IF brands, we are proudly whatever, whatever, okay, cool, you've gotten the functionalities out of the way, you've gotten the ratings out of the way, but what is the story that I resonate with? Because we get so functional that we do not understand, that we forget that at the end of the day, you are selling to human beings. And because of the fact that you are selling to human beings, they almost automatically require you to be responsive. And it's, also, and it's kind of confusing, right? Because in a world that's almost automated and almost digital, so everything is almost at a push of a button, and if I put my noodles in the microwave, they're going to come out in two minutes. So we then almost want to take that same framework and plug it into every individual because it worked the last time, so why shouldn't it work, why shouldn't it work now? So I say that the L, the first L, covered up, says that entrepreneurship, the ethos of entrepreneurship is in understanding that entrepreneurship is a human being activity. So be human being about it. Entrepreneurship is a human being activity, so be a human being about it. What does that mean? Be creative. Be spontaneous. See the things that are unseen. Understand that listen becomes critical in the sense that it aligns both body, mind, and soul. Listen, listening is, is connected to your taste buds. It's connected to your eyesight. It's connected to your feeling. It's connected to your, all your senses, idea. It's connected to your nose. So when we're talking about listen, as an entrepreneur, hear out for all these things around you, and when you start to hear out for all these things around you, you develop your sixth sense. And your sixth sense is all of them combinated together. And, you, and then you add them all up together, and you, and you develop a combustible 
ideology. So the diversion tactic is, how do you then get into those spaces? So one of the simple things, oh, this is very simple, and I'll show you the, 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 the word diversion tactic, right? Uh, or diversion strategy is a fancy one, and you probably do this all the time. So at the time where we wanted to do work for PepsiCo, PepsiCo shut us down all the time, but they had what we needed. We had no ambitions of doing work with CCBSA, which is Coca-Cola in the country, right? We had no ambitions at all because we understood the red tape there. We didn't really, there wasn't really much bandwidth for the machines that we had at the time. But the person that we wanted was, was PepsiCo because of the activations that we were rolling out all over the country in the, in the marginalized communities and the townships and all that stuff. And we wanted to be in that space. So what, then we, then, so what, then what we then did is that we then understood that that's their competitor because every second or third word in a meeting they mentioned them. Every second or third word they mentioned them. We, we were trying to be as competitive as, we were trying to drive sales as, so we then went to CCBSA and we said that we have identified that you guys do activations and so and so and so and so. We understand that you have a supplier, we would like to complement that offering and we want to do it for free. So we did that, right? We did that for about three months. Six months later, I was back at the same office, knocking, but now my tune has changed. My tune is now, um, the reason why they were successful at driving the narrative and growing their sales and driving, did you hear that Coke last year sold per month 10,000 cans of Coca-Cola? Well, anyway, forget about that. What we are trying to say is that we could help you position your brand in the right way within the market. Would you like to work with us? What did we do? It's a diversion tactic. They were looking at them and not me. It's never about you, but it's always about them, and it's nothing personal, it's business. It's never about them, it's never about you, it's always about them. It's never about you, it's all about them. So in positioning yourself in the client's shoes, you're positioning yourself for a sale. I always say to people that if you step into a networking environment, and if you step into a, a meeting room or a sales room and you're going to sell, and the client asks you why or how, you've got the sale. If ever you introduce yourself to anyone and you engage a client and they ask you why or how, you've got the sale. Why do I say that? Because when they ask those questions, what they are asking is, I've heard the functionality, you do it quick. I've heard the fact that you are whatever, whatever. But what I'm giving you an opportunity to do now is sell me on your story. Sell me on what differentiates you from everybody else. Don't sell me on the plumbing perspective, but sell me on what you do because I have bought into who you are. My second L is learn. My second L is learn. We never stop learning. We never stop learning. We never stop learning. We know this, right? We never stop learning. We never stop learning. We never stop learning. Right? We never stop learning. We never stop learning. But let me ask a question in the room. How many entrepreneurs who are in this room actively participate? or actively take charge of their lives, of their personal growth. Perfect. But what about the rest? So let me, let me pose something to you, right? What is likely to happen to a lot of businesses is, so a business starts. And then fundamentally, if it goes well, let's focus on the ones that go well, right? A unicorn. So what unicorning means is, I don't know if, if there are people in the room that resonate to this, but it happened to me, right? You grow at an accelerated rate. The sense is not common. The second best way of breeding learning in and around your work environment is being able to create an environment that is free and that is open to learning. One of the first aids of that is systems and process. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot stop putting emphasis on how important systems and processes. Now, how many people think that, how many people hear systems and processes? I know, I know you've heard this a lot of times from other amazing facilitators or blogs or even yourself. How many of you hear this and start to think, yep, that's so technical? <laughs> 
No, no, let's be honest. How many, how many of you think, yo, another load, because that's entrepreneurship, right? You feel like, yo, another load is on my table. I just want to make due, man. It's mundane. I'm busy here. I'm in, this, I'm in this rectangular office. I'm supposed to learn, but I need to make sales, man. I need to. So how many of you hear the word systems and process and you think, yo, I've got another job? Excuse me? It's a, lot of it's, a, <laughs> it's a lot of work, but what, what I always say to, to entrepreneurs right, is start it small. But by starting it small means that you must commit, and you commit till the very end, and you will become accountable. So if you want someone to replace you in your functions, you need to map out every single thing that you do on a daily basis. And my mentor broke it down to me that way, is that when they learn you want someone to replace you, right? So for seven days, write down, push, write, not push, write down everything you do each and every day. From the time you wake up all the way up until you sleep. Everything you do. So you're driving to where, you're driving to do what, you get there, you do what, you get there. And then on the eighth day, take time out for an hour or two hours. And then ask yourself a question. Could someone else do this? Number two, if, if, if you answered yes, if they could do it, what would they need to know and how would they need to do it? That's a system. Because the whole point, the, the whole point and the whole idea, the ideology of it is, it was never to have you physical. It was never to have you physical. It was never to have you because you're an entrepreneur. So I've met a lot of people that said, well, I'm making the bakery rich. And because I'm making the bakery rich, I'm gonna go start my own bakery. That's the worst reason you could ever go. One of the worst reasons you could ever go into entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because the moment you go into entrepreneurship, you realize that now you're an administrator. Yeah. You are now the cleaner. Yeah. You are now the auditor. You are now the accountant. Mm -hmm. You are now the logistics manager. Mm -hmm. You are now the head of HR. You are now the procurement manager. Mm -hmm. And what happens to that passion? That passion diminishes at the sight of every other thing that needs to happen in and around you. So what then becomes the creative? What then becomes the role of an entrepreneur from a learning perspective? It's so that you can drive the, it's so that you can drive the founder's mentality or the founder's vision and consistently and, and consistently innovate ideas in and around the growth of your business. But at this base level in bringing it home, because we are fully hands-on and we are functional in our organization, the first growth level is you in you mapping yourself out and removing yourself from the functionality of the business is you daily writing down the things that need to be done. So one smart guy says, it's simple, Bula and I. It's, it's called a checklist. It's simple, it's called a checklist. You hire your son, you hire Susie, right, from the list that you have done. You want Susie to execute on your work. What does she need to do? Give her a list of things that she needs to do, and by when does she need to do them by? And by we and weekly you have huddle meetings. So what is a huddle meeting? The first, the first set of the huddle meeting is, here's the task. The second set of the huddle meeting is, we're going to come back and regroup so that you can tell me what you have done. So in him or she feeding me back what I have done, what, what am I doing in the process? I'm not just scratching out the fact that you are useless, you're not doing these things in time, it gives you a perfect opportunity to. No, no, because it happens, and, and it happens, it also happens to me because I'm an entrepreneur and I can make things at the same time, right? But it also gives you a perfect opportunity to now coach. Gives you a perfect opportunity to now coach. So, let me tell you how important this is. So, 100 CEOs were interviewed by, the, by a company called Bain. So Bain is one of the biggest companies in the world that do turnaround strategies and all that stuff, right? So they interviewed them and they asked them a couple of things. What are you struggling with? And what did you find most important for you to mitigate? So I'll talk about the struggle, but one of the, one of the most important things that they almost replicated throughout everything is what they called the Monday meeting. Because they then said that as a CEO of a large organization, I found the Monday meeting because to become important. It has to be in, in, in the staff members to also find trust and our customers to find trust in us. But why? I mean, it's such a big organization, anyone could do it and we could delegate it to anyone else. But they then say that, but the buck stops with us. So if the buck stops with us, what we then need to do is then develop a cycle and shorten the cycle of response. So the most critical and important things almost need to be decided by the head. But if it takes them two or three or two months for them to reach a decision, what, the, what, happens to, what happens to the growth of the business, it stagnates up until the decision is made. It's similar to a sale. 
Being in different industries, it then becomes important to understand what is your sales cycle so that you don't stress yourself. If your clients are only buying at the end of the month, what are you selling at the beginning of the month? If your buyers only have meetings on the second week of the month, and that is an industry standard, why are you stressing yourself and you're giving yourself heart palpitation? Then you are positioning your brand and you're focusing the energy and the effort purely on the things that work and purely on the things that, that, that matter at the end of the day. But they then said that the Monday meeting becomes important, it becomes crucial. So I know that we do meetings in different and various ways and don't, don't consider the Monday meeting way more important than your Tuesday or your Wednesday meeting. But all it means at the end of the day is there must be a time of task and there must be a time of feedback and there must be a time of coaching. There must be a time of task. There must be a time of feedback. Um, the sophisticated people who are in the HR space call it measurements, right? Where they measure you by according to your KPIs. But there must be a time of task, there must be a time of measurement, or rather a time of feedback, and then there must be a time of coaching. And then when we then start to focus on what are some of the three things that cause demise? I spoke about the first one, to a great organization or rather an, an organization that wants to be an insurgent organization. Your revenue growing faster than your talent. So we're covering it in what we just spoke about right now, huddling sessions and Monday meetings and closing off the loop. The, certain, the, sorry, sorry, the second thing that I highlighted as being a scary big thing all around the world is the entrepreneurs themselves becoming the bottleneck of the organization. Because how many of us think that it can only be done by you? I feel that, right? Because yeah. I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm an entrepreneur speaking to other entrepreneurs. I feel that all the time. But that mentality as well comes from a position of frustration because we're disappointed by people, right? It comes from a point of you practiced it and you've exercised it. Meaning that in order for you not to become the bottleneck, the system then become crucial. The huddle ses sessions become also very crucial. But an important question my mentor always, and he has this on his office, he asks himself this question each and every day in the morning. What am I doing today to stand in the way of the growth of my business? What am I doing today to stand in the way of the growth of my business? Because you see, it's a humanly thing to always think that the, the factors are always external. But the factors that are external are beyond your control. What do we have control over? The internal factors. And the decay of most organizations starts, begins at the epicenter, which is at the heart, which is in the center. So you find an, you find an organization in a budding market, but this organization is dying out. They're dying out purely because of the internal stuff that is going all the way wrong. They're dying out because if there's not one individual, there's no functionality. They're dying out because there's no huddle session. They're dying out because there's no growth at the end of the day. And that, that, what that then does is that it frustrates growth. So we then become the bottlenecks of our own success. And it causes frustrations. So I think that, and so I think that being in this space, right, I'd like to propose that let's reconsider. But let's just not reconsider as an internal personal capacity building exercise. Let's reconsider practically when we go back and see what could we relinquish. And how could you measure that? Because there are three elements, right, in terms of business. And you'll find this in a book called The E-Myth. The first one is the technician mode. It's the management mode, it's the entrepreneurial. And the right percentage or the right, or the right scale to have this is 70% entrepreneurial, 20% managerial, because you never relinquish that, and 10% functionality. But what happens to a lot of us? You're sitting there, you're typing out emails, and you always think to yourself, but I've hired someone to do this, but you find yourself doing the very same thing that you've hired someone else to do. What, what, what does that do? It leaves little for the individual to become an entrepreneur. And it also, and you need to understand that it's obviously going to come with a lot of pain. What does that pain mean? You're probably going to lose money. Why? You're going to lose money because you're already a working formula, and you're trying to get other cohorts to jump in and do this thing your way. Right? And, the, and the, the frustration of visual visionaries that you always live in 20 or 30 or 100 years into the future. Why can't you get it right now? Because you're messing up an essential step of where we are going. But it becomes an essential step because by you getting an individual who get that one functionality right, you work yourself out of the system and you forget about it. And you focus on it at 
the hardened session. And everything that ties in, and building systems, everything ties into the next. Everything then ties into the next. Because whatever system that you are building in, and whatever checklists, checklists that you are building into your organization, right? Or rather, not of an organization, but all the various staff members that you have, they tie into reporting lines. So they are measurable reporting lines so that you are able to, from a coaching perspective, add your value because your, your value and your vision becomes the growth of the business. And the third one, right, is just that, the mission. What happens to a lot of us, or rather a lot of global organizations, they forget the vision. They forget the vision. It's not just at a base level. It happens to multinationals that are making billions of dollars. They forget the vision and the mission. They forget the vision and the mission. Same thing happened to Hewlett Pocket. So they were very clear about what they wanted to do and it was just, just that one thing. They were very clear about what they wanted to do. But you know what happened? The shareholders that came in at the time, unilaterally voted and they started buying shares and in Siemens and other things that were not aligned and it started to frustrate the base of what they were trying or what they were all about at the end of the day and it answers and I think the mission at the end of the day answers what is your why and does everyone in your organization understand the why and are they living by the why and are they all about the why at the end of the, at the, end of the day the last thing uh, I'm taking too much time give me about 10, 15 more minutes the last thing is what they call the doom loop so, the, the fancy word. So, there was a company called Norwegian Cruise Lines. They started out, a couple of years in, they made $200 million. A couple of more years in, they make $800 million. They then sell it out. The guys that come in, the, the guys that come in, they don't do they, they, well, what they did, what they did uniquely to the organization is, Instead of offering cruise line packages where you come in for a certain period of time, now you could have flexibility. So now you could actually choose, I want to sleep on the first floor. I don't want to do these activities. So you kind of custom make your own experience, right? On the cruise line, on this luxury cruise lines. But the frustration was that because of the, because of the fact that there was clients surfing onto different products, what then happened is that it then frustrated the growth of the organization. Because the systems were not aligned to the offering. The systems were not aligned to the operating within cause started to cause confusion. That's what they call the doom loop. Everything is everything, everything is latching onto the next and nothing is making sense. So so when the guys who are supposed to be rendering the service are rendering the service, they are told, no, 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 it, it doesn't align with the system because this is not what I ordered. But what the client is saying is that you are not operating according to the functional processes of the organization. But the employees themselves are frustrated because no one knows what the oh, well, no one knows what the modus of operandi is. There's only one individual who knows, and that individual is not here, so what do we do? So they sit on the sidelines and they do not participate. And what happens to the growth of the organization? It plummets. The fifth thing is frontliners. So when you are not here, who's at the office? Mm. That's the frontliner. Yeah. And how many of us silence the voice of the frontliners because we're smart? Yeah. We silence the voice of the frontliners. And that frustrates because, because the individual who's welcoming people in, that's the person who knows what's going on. Yeah. The lady at my office who's at the reception, she knows what's going on. I, I, and you know, you could correct me on this, but it's my opinion. I believe that she knows more than the manager. In terms of the culture, in terms of the activities, in terms of, in terms of what's going on, that's the crucial individual. But whenever I'm receiving crucial feedback, or whenever we're receiving crucial feedback, who do we ask the manager? And what are we asking about? How much did we make today? Did whoever come into work today? Did they damage anything? Are we all on track? Did we get all the right stock? We get all the functionals right, but we need to then watch for the why. But more than the why is the culture. Because you need to understand that people that are in the front end, they are watching for the culture. The culture is that what you told me when you employed me, and what you always spoke about, now you are not here, and I'm watching for that. It's that invisible, visible. No one can touch it, no one can smell it, no one can touch it, no one can smell it, but you almost know it. You step into a room and you automatically feel like, hey, I don't think I belong here. Yeah. You automatically shake someone's hand and you get into a two second conversation like, hey, I don't think there's synergies here. It's the aura. It's the culture. It's the aura. It's the culture. 
It's that intangible that grabs, that holds the organization together. Because let me just, let, let me just, let me just, let me just redirect for a bit, right? The four critical things in building a brand is vision, which is your why, is the mission, which is the objective, is the values, and it's the culture. So, the vision inspires us. The mission is what we do each and every day. The values is how we do it. The culture is the key. The vision is the why. We are inspired. We're going to be the whatever. We're going to do the whatever. This is why we're going to be doing it and this is how we're going to be doing it. And this one is our modus of operandi. This is the functionality. Because based on values, you determine who you hire and who you fire. Based on values, you decide also, it, values also help you in mapping out which clients to work with and which clients not to work with. Because how many of us really just sitting on this subject and I'm going to close off very soon. How many of us have no integrity as our value? Yeah. Or no people who have said statements like, I don't go to such places, darling, I got values. <laughs> I don't drink A, B, C, and D because I got values. <laughs> I don't hang out with A, B, C, and D because I've heard a lot of people say that. But how many people who've said that, who've heard people say that, actually think those people know what they mean? <laughs> how many of us have, and the popular one, integrity as a value? <laughs> I have it. Yeah. Everyone has it, yeah. has it right? Yeah. But how is it measurable for you in your organization? So, you, you can't measure it, right? Because when I hire Tabo, this, this is very critical, right? When, and when I hire Tabo and I tell him that our value is integrity, how does he measure it? And then I then go a step further and I say, well, we're going to define integrity as being honest or doing what you said you would do when you said you would do it, right? Okay, it's cool. <clears throat> but the definition is relative. So he will receive it in his own way. So, what's, what's the easiest step? Define what the value is. Number two, what? select the value. Before you even select the value, go on to Google. Do what they call the values exercise. It's free, it's going to change your life, personally and business. After you do that, map out at least four or five values. You can do more, but if you've got the time, you can do more. I would always suggest that you do four. Map out four values that, that, that line up with what you envision your organization to be all about. The second thing is that define it. Define it. What does integrity mean to you? So one of our values is creativity and it needs to stand out. But you still can't measure that, right? Then we go to the next step. And the next and the last step is, through a four-point check, write down how people in your organization need to measure creativity. So we then first have to think to ourselves, okay, first, you need to be able to demonstrate through a client sheet that you understand the client's need. The second step, you need to then exhibit that you have taken the client through our product catalog. And the third step, you need to, have ex you need to exhibit through, through support of a manager that you show clients two other options over and above the one because we never believe in giving clients way more than three options because then you end up confusing the clients and you end up confusing the sale and you never walk away with a sale. You keep it simple. So what are these two, what, what are these two options that you're going to give to the client that are either going to save or grow their brand? Number three. What is the one thing that you're going to do to this one? What are the one thing that you're going to add that is going to cost us 0% but is going to get the client talking about us? So when something goes wrong in the pipeline, we then ask, well, where's the sheet? Oh, okay. Okay, this is the client's need, okay. This is the advice. Okay, the manager signed off on number three. There were these three options, but where was the wow factor, which is what sets us apart. So that's because our cost is 0% but it's going to get people talking about us. Things done. <laughs> champion. Yeah. See, it's a champion. So say this after me. Get things done. Get things done. Get things done. Get things done. Because the only the only reason why I always ask people to say this after me, right, is because when it's all said and done, you guys are partnered up with Sokosan, you're doing amazing things. But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, what what effort are you putting in? Because at the end of the day, it's all about getting things done. So you're here now, I think it's the third or fourth day, right? So? Because at the end of the day, your, your bank balance, your employees, your, your, your dreams and your joy are going to be looking at you like, okay, so show us, babe. And it all comes down to simply 
getting yeah. things yeah. done yeah. and getting everything around you to get things done on your behalf. Mm -hmm. So just one last time before they kick me out of here, <laughs> I know the people next door in the session, get things done! Get things done! Thank you so much, my name Woo! is Angela. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.